Welcome to another Apollo Papyrus podcast episode. I am Aaron Apollo Camp. This episode's interview guest is a stand-up comedian, Substack newsletter writer, and the author of the novel Stony Mountain Park. His name is John Richard Bradbury, or J.R. Bradbury for short, and here's my interview of J.R. John Bradbury, welcome to Apollo Papyrus. Great to be here. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself to our listeners. Okay. Uh, my name is John Bradbury. Um, I do some stand-up comedy. I recently uh, published a book called Stony Mountain Park. It's about a talking black bar, a black bear in a fi- in a fictitious park in Maine. The black bear could talk, and um, he kills a trophy hunter in self-defense. Unfortunately, it turns out the self the um, the trophy hunter is wanted for running a Ponzi scheme, and it's it's a there's also got some politics in it, and it takes place uh, in 2000, but with no COVID, but before the election. Now, uh, you mentioned a, uh, a fair amount about your your uh, book already, but without spoiling too much of your book, Stony Mountain Park, uh, what is your book about? Well, it's okay. It's about, so there's two really main characters. There's Jack Rollins, who is a, a alcoholic, and he gets discovered by his friends who are park rangers at Stony Mountain Park. And they kind of help him get his life together. They help get him a job. And he uses microdosing of LSD to uh, help him in his recovery. And then there's Raymond, the black bear, who chose the name because of the blacklist, Raymond Reddington. And as I said, now that uh, they killed the trophy hunter in self-defense and he's wanted by the FBI. So there's basically a lot of things going at the same time. And there's a lot in Raymond. The bear is learning about humanity through the Internet and TV. They get him a little cabin in the forest. And so he's often got questions about history. and He's got questions about TV and just, you know, how things, it's, it's sort of like, how would an animal look at the way humans behave? It's, de- it's kind of a comedy, but it's definitely got a lot of serious themes to it, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, what motivated you to uh, write your book? Because when I was writing down the interview questions, I uh, uh, initially thought that uh, the real-life story of the cocaine bear uh, in the uh, the Georgia Tennessee wilderness uh, was the inspiration from your book. I don't think that's the case. No, it actually wasn't because uh, now I'm not, I know the story happened along and I'm not saying that I don't know when the screenplay was written, but the movie I had written the book before the movie came out. So I didn't know about it. I thought it was really just a coincidence. As soon as talking is, um, you know, cocaine bear came out. I was like, okay, well, I guess bears doing drugs is a, I, a lot, in a lot of ways, Jack Rollins, the park ranger is somewhat based on my life. Obviously I've never met a talking bear, but I've struggled um, with alcoholism to a degree. And I've also used microdosing of LSD and it really, um, it helped me to clarify. It helped me to focus. And I, I started writing. And within about nine weeks, I was able to get the original manuscript. The idea, the idea I just kind of rolled. And, and uh, so this is my first book. I really don't have much of a background in writing or anything like that. But uh, microdosing of LSD is dealt with in the book. And it's something I've looked. It's actually nothing you know, using LSD to help people with PTSD and, and with uh, alcoholism and stuff like that is a very, oh, it's been done since the 1950s until in the 60s when it was outlawed and the war on drugs came. And, and a lot of that research was just kind of pushed to the side. But 
that's I kind of just want it. So it's definitely not like an autobiography by any stretch, but there's a lot of of me in the main character. Uh, how long did it take you to write your book and what was the most difficult part of the writing process for you? Uh, well, it took me nine weeks, the last week in November to the first to the first month of January of of last year. The first part, I'd say the, the manuscript, the original actually came pretty easily. The difficult part was afterwards getting it edited and realizing, you know, how many things I wasn't doing right. Because oh, I, I published, I self-published. And that's definitely a difficult part because you have to do a lot of the promotion yourself. But like, and I would tell this to any writer, save you the suspense. Your first manuscript, your first draft is going to have a lot of flaws in it. And I think for a long time, I kind of just, I wanted it to be perfect. And I was like, well, if, and, and so what I did is I just wrote and I didn't worry about, cause I knew that I was going to rewrite this. And so I just decided to get it on paper. Like just, you know, get something to work with and then you have something that you can edit. Um, everything since the first draft has been difficult to a degree because I'm new to all this. Um, you know, getting a book cover, getting, uh, you know, editing, rewriting it, getting, you know, that it's a process. I mean, anyone can self-publish, but, it you know, it will you will have to spend some money. And it's, a, you know, there's a lot of extra stuff. It isn't just write the book and then, uh, you know, you type your final word and then you're you're done. It's a, it's an ex I mean, like the nine weeks was my first draft, but the book wasn't released until July, even though my first draft was done like three days, February 3rd. Uh, uh, you also write a, a Substack newsletter. Uh, what is the name of your Substack newsletter and what types of posts do you uh, typically write for it? I do write, and I know that you do too. I found that out. Yeah, <laughs> I'm. I write one Substack newsletter called Apollo Thoughts, and I'm going to be launching the Apollo Papyrus uh, uh, Substack newsletter probably around the time this episode gets uploaded. Great, great. Um, so yeah, mine's mine's just called JR Substack. J.R. Bradbury. I'm John Richard Bradbury, but if you look on the cover of my book, it'll say J.R. Bradbury because uh, there's another John Bradbury. So I just went with that. Plus, the the initial letters is very authory, <laughs> for lack of a better word. But uh, it's just called J.R. Substack. Um, I've been doing that since July. And I, I do between one to two articles a week and it, it ranges from all different things i i sometimes write i definitely do politics you know as an atheist i i write some about religion and and the problems that it causes uh but also i write about personal you know like with mushrooms microdosing lsd and and stuff like that um so I, I'm definitely not nailed into one, one thing, but yes, it's just Jr. Substack. Uh, I understand you're you're a stand-up comedian in addition to uh, an author and a Substack newsletter writer. And what has your stand-up comedy career been like? And what comedians have inspired you as a comedian? Well, career is being kind of generous. I, I've done the, uh, some open mics, and where I live in Maine, there aren't... I live on the eastern part. I'm not near Portland, where a lot of the clubs are. So I've done it for the last 15 years, but I, I never really... I'm just getting into really doing it, where I'm doing longer sets and stuff like that. Um, it, my favorite comedians... Are of course George Carlin and Richard Pryor. I mean, they really started stand-up comedy as we know it. 
you know, because in the 50s, it was a lot of, you know, punchline and drum. And the idea of like telling stories and politics and life, you know, definitely started with them. But also, I love David Cross. Um, you know, and there's people like Bill Burr, uh, Dennis Leary's really funny. Um, there's quite a few, but I would say Carlin, Richard Pryor, David Cross are some of my, and Chappelle, I like him a lot, are, are some of my biggest influences. How would you describe your political and religious views? I know you uh, made a passing mention that you're an atheist a little bit earlier in the interview. Yeah, because uh, I, well, so as an atheist, I mean, like, I just, I didn't grow up in a religious household, so it was never really forced upon me. And I just, in 2024, and this is always a touchy subject, I, I feel like most people in the United States don't live their lives on the Bible. That's why we don't stone unruly children, and we don't, uh, we don't, you know, we wear mixed fabrics. We don't worry about meat. We don't have slavery anymore. So, and if you look, as far as my politics, I'm on the left, definitely. Um, I vote Democrat, kind of by default, because I'm certainly not going to be a Republican. Um, as far as, like, Trump, you know, I mean, I there's definitely, I'm, I wouldn't consider myself woke. I believe there's definitely people on, especially as a stand-up comedian, I don't like the idea of canceling people, even if if I don't like what they're saying. I'm I'm against censorship, um, but you know when you talk about like Trump, and, and my main issue with Trump, well, there's a lot of issues with Trump, but you know, like in January sixth when Trump lost by you know like seven million, votes, you know, they tried to steal an election. You know, so we say like, well, why can't we just agree to disagree? But, you know, Trump supporters tried to steal my vote and everyone else's that was a Democrat. So it's not like I, I hate you if you're a Trump supporter, but we're kind of at an impasse because if we're going to have a debate and you're just going to make up facts, we're really not going to get anywhere. And as far as like Christianity, uh, there's, of course, there's lots of Democrats that are Christians, but the fact that, like, evangelicals, especially with the idea of so many Christians that back Donald Trump, just exposes their hypocrisy. You know, I mean, the fact that you're going to go with this guy just proves that you really don't care who you go with. Uh, one final uh, question. Uh, what was your struggle with alcoholism like? How long have you been sober? And did uh, LSD and or other psychedelic drugs help you in your battle against alcoholism? Well, so from like 2000, like from my 20s, I was an extremely heavy drinker. Probably I'd go to two to three half gallons of vodka or it made three to four half gallon, those big plastic judges jugs that you see in the liquor section. I'd go through that in a week. But in my 30s, I, I started to slow down a lot. Um, and I'm not on the wagon now. I do drink sometimes. I do, yeah. Um, and so it wasn't like I just quit cold turkey. But as, as I got into my mid-30s, I slowed down. I quit drinking near as much because I was just older. It wasn't fun. And it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons not to be drunk all the time. As far as microdosing LSD, um, which I've been doing for about, you know, I probably started a couple years ago, about a year and a half ago. Yes, it has helped a lot. And it's helped a lot of people. I don't know if you're familiar with the movies, the old Cary Grant, you know, he tripped at, he did it once a week with his psychiatrist. I keep going back to the 50s, but for the 50s, it, it even Bill Wilson, the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, believed that LSD could could be a, a very could really help people. Um, it's hard to explain, especially to anyone who's never tripped LSD. It, you know, you've either done it or you haven't. Um, 
it gives you a certain when you microdose, which is basically taking like one tenth of a hit, maybe two times a week, and you cycle. I mean, there's a you know different people do it different ways, but it it's it gave me a certain comfort that I didn't need a substance at all. Like I just I feel better, and it allowed me to think of things that I never would have thought of. Um, I don't know if you've ever tripped before. Uh, no, I I take a prescribed antidepressant uh, for clinical depression, but uh, no, I've never had uh, actual psychedelic drugs. But there's uh, been some drugs that uh, I've been given for an for an autism spectrum disorder. I have like a uh, Ritalin and Adderall that have given me uh, not only kind of a psychedelic like effect like uh, seeing and hearing things that aren't there and having chest pain uh, with Adderall and, Adderall and, and Ritalin in my case. Uh, but that's not quite the same thing as no. a psychedelic trip. No, no, it isn't. Um, so to do stand-up comedy, and it's kind of the same thing with writing, you sort of develop what's called the third eye. Where, like, for example, as a comedian, I could be at the DMV and I will think of something that's funny about it. And it's the same with writing, especially when you're writing a fiction, because you, you're creating a whole story. Now, actually, you asked me earlier what was my hardest thing to do when writing. And one thing about writing a story that I didn't think about first was each character, you have to come up with a lot of characters. And you have to make them fit in with each other. So that could be difficult. Um, but back to what we were talking about. Yeah, so I do drink sometimes, but I don't I don't drink if I have to go to work the next day. I you know, I go weeks without doing it. And I don't need it. And that's the big thing. And it doesn't matter if it's a, any drug that you need as a crutch. And I'm not talking about a prescription. That's a, a totally different thing. But I'm talking about like an escape drug, like alcohol, or even if it's marijuana or something. You know, if you need it, if you just can't function without it, especially something like alcohol, it, it'll take control of your life. I mean, granted, it might help with some creativity at first, but... You know, especially with alcohol, it's horrible for your body, for your health. And, it, you know, it, it it was to the, like, in my 20s, I needed it. It was a crutch. I mean, like, I couldn't go to work without it. If I went more than three or four hours without it, I'd throw up. I mean, that's, you know. Um, so it's, it's hard to, like, you know, I would just, people who have tripped LSD, Definitely know where I'm coming from. And and of course, that is definitely something you can overdo. Like I say, microdosing is taking a tenth of one hit. Um, it just, it gave me a certain, it's, it's one thing to come up with a story in your head. It's another thing to sit there and spend a few hours writing your first chapter and your second chapter. And the the, the focus, I guess, is what I, was the word I'm looking for. Because no matter what we're doing, whether you're writing for your Substack or whether you're doing a podcast, or I don't know, I you know the other things that you do, it requires focus, especially if that is not your day to day job. You know, if you have a regular job and then you come home, and then you want to write, or you whatever, write songs or music for people who do that. You need focus. You need the focus to say, look. This is what I need to do, and I'm not going to watch Netflix, or I'm not going to go surf the web. Oh, you know what I mean? Exactly. John, thank you for appearing on Apollo Papyrus. You were an interesting guest. Well, thanks for having me. This is actually the second podcast I've ever been on. I did my first uh, two weeks ago. I just started with Podmatch. And I'm probably, I, I definitely plan on starting a podcast on Substack. Um, and so, yeah, I guess that's uh, that's pretty much my story so far. 
The book is available on Amazon. As a reminder, the Apollo Papyrus newsletter on Substack will launch on Friday, February 9th, and I will include a link to both my soon-to-be-launched Apollo Papyrus newsletter and JR's newsletter in the text description of this episode. This is Aaron Apollo Camp reminding y'all to write and read your passion. Bye for now. Remember to subscribe to the Apollo Papyrus YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash at Apollo Papyrus and the Apollo Papyrus Substack newsletter at apollopapyrus.substack.com. Y'all can visit the Apollo Papyrus website at camparenapollo.witsite.com forward slash Apollo Papyrus and follow Apollo Papyrus on threads, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr at Apollo Papyrus. Copyright 2024, Aaron Apollo Camp, all rights reserved. This podcast episode is intended for the private listening of our audience. Any reuse or retransmission of this episode without the express written consent of the podcast host is prohibited, except under fair use guidelines. Royalty-free music and sound effects obtained from https colon forward slash forward slash www.zapsplat.com.